Let's talk about lichen planets. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be continuing our dermatology series and we're going to be looking at lichen planus. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Whenever you're talking about the word lichen planus, Remember that lichen means tree moss and planus means flat. So pretty much lichen planus is a flat topped rash. It's a relatively common pruritic popular dermatosis that's going to be involving the flexure surfaces as well as the mucous membranes and the genitals of individuals. The actual cause of the condition is unknown, but what we believe is that there is an immune pathogenesis that has been implicated. All age groups are affected where children are not commonly affected, but individuals between the ages of 30 and 60 are commonly affected by the disease. There is no gender or racial predilection to the condition. In the exact uh, pathogenesis of the condition, we actually do not know what exactly causes the disease. But what we believe is that there is some immune dysfunction with alteration in the surface keratinocyte presentation, as well as subsequent cytotoxic T reactions. So recall that the skin has predominantly three main layers. An upper layer, which is referred to as an epidermis, that consists of five histological layers in thick skin and four histological layers in thin skin. Beneath this is a dermis divided into two parts, a papillary part, which is the upper dermis, which is consisting of these foldings that are finger like projections that are known as dermal papillae. Then the lower part is known as the reticular dermis, which has connective tissue and reticular like fibers of connective tissue. In the lower layer, you have the subcutaneous tissue, which of course is going to be consisting of fat. Now remember that the epidermis is made up of keratinocytes. 90% of the epidermis is going to be filled with these cells and about 10% is going to be the melanocytes. So in lichen planus, you get these healthy keratinocytes that are going to be presenting antigen on major histocompatibility protein 1. And recall that MHC1 or major histocompatibility protein 1 is going to be present in all nucleated cells. So this is going to be presented to the cytotoxic T cells. And these cytotoxic T cells are going to be stimulated and they're going to end up killing these keratinocytes and in the process they're going to release cytokines that are recruiting more cytotoxic T cells and this is going to be causing more damage to the keratinocytes and eventually the basal lamina, the basal layer of the epidermis. Now whenever you get a damage to the basal layer of the epidermis this is going to result in changes in the dermal epidermal junction. Recall that normally the dermal epidermal junction is very smooth and it looks like a sine wave but instead of it actually being smooth it's going to transition, it's going to change and become angulated or so toothed. The melanocytes that are also going to be present in the stratum basali are also going to become damaged and they're going to release their melanin. So it means that there may be some skin changes that may happen in lichen planus. So there may be hyperpigmentation where the skin actually appears darker than it actually is. Then with progressive inflammation that's going to be taking place, the damage is actually going to extend beyond the stratum basali into the stratum granulosum. Rem remember that the R layers of the epidermis, the stratum basali is the lower layer followed by the stratum spinosum, followed by the stratum granulosum, followed by the stratum lucidum, which is only found in thick skin. And eventually you have the stratum corneum, which is the uppermost layer. So remember that the keratinocytes in the stratum granulosum are going to respond by increasing in their number. They're also increasing in their size. And this is actually going to cause the stratum granulosa to thicken, a condition that we refer to as hypergranulosis. Of course, there is some genetic predisposition that has been implicated in the pathogenesis of the condition. And these skin eruptions have actually been associated with certain systemic drugs and certain viral infections such as hepatitis C and hepatitis B. But of course, no definitive cause has been identified. Some common drugs that have been linked with lichen planus include gold, 
beta blockers, uh, AC inhibitors, antibiotics, diuretics, as well as antimalarials. And what you really need to take note is that if the cause is actually identified, we do not refer to it as lichen planus, but we rather call it as a lichenoid reaction. And it's not going to be referred to as lichen planus. When it comes to the clinical presentation of the condition, this just largely depends on the site of inflammation. We can actually characterize the presentation into two main groups. You have what is referred to as cutaneous lichen planus and oral lichen planus. Cutaneous lichen planus is going to be affecting the skin, the nails, and the hair. In about two-thirds of these cases, you're going to see this in people that are aged between 30 to 60 years. So often the forearms, the wrist, the elbows, the lower legs, the thighs, the genitalia, the palms, and the soles of the feet are often affected. And remember that lichen planus tends to start on the limbs. It then may progress rapidly to become generalized and within about four weeks. And, but the much more common uh, localized forms progress more slowly. Then you may, it may also affect the mucous membranes. You may have oral lichen planus, which may affect the buccal mucosa and it may also affect the anal genital region. This occurs in individuals that are between the age of 45 to 65 years. And of course, it's going to present you with these papules that can sometimes be covered by a white lace-like material, which is reticular-like, and you refer to this as Wickham striae. This is actually the most common feature that we're going to be seeing in oral lichen planus. And of course, the prominent Mucosal symptom is, of course, severe pain rather than itch. And both the cutaneous and the oral manifestations in some cases may present at the same time. Here is a picture that's showing you this white lace-like Wickham striae that are present in the buccal mucosa. So this is oral presentation of lichen planus. Now, to characterize the symptom, they are what is referred to as the seven Ps. Some books may actually give you the six Ps. So the first P is that this rash is planar, meaning that it has a flat top. The second P is that it's polygonal, meaning that the rash has multiple sides. It can present to you as papules. Remember, papules have a diameter less than five millimeters. If we're using a threshold of one mil of 10 uh, millimeters or one centimeter, they are plaques. They have a diameter of greater than five millimeters or 10 millimeters. Then of course, they are purple in color. They are puritic, meaning that they are itchy and they tend to appear polished. You may also get hyperpigmentation that is common after resolution of the lesions, especially in people with pigmented skin. On this image here shown on the right is a person that has hypertrophic lichen planus. And as we can see, there is some hyperpigmentation that we can note on this individual. Then, of course, here you have this typical violaceous papules that can be seen in individuals that have lichen planus that is affecting the wrist. When it comes to the diagnosis of the condition, the clinical diagnosis, the key diagnostic features are going to include the seven Ps that we just talked about. But of course, the diagnosis is going to be confirmed by a skin biopsy. On your skin biopsy, what are you expecting to see? This here, the junction between the dermis and the epidermis is referred to as the dermo-epidermal junction. It's not smooth in here. It develops this sore-toothed appearance. So the first thing that you may see is the sore-toothed appearance. You may see this a prominent granular layer that is there. So this hypergranulosis where the stratum granulosum actually begins to thicken and the cells become much more prominent. And of course, the basal cells may show liquefaction, degeneration, and of of course, some lymphocytes may infiltrate in a band-like fashion. A differential diagnosis for lichen planus includes conditions like psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, petriasis rosea, tinea corporis, lichenoid drug reactions that may actually be indistinguishable from lichen planus. When it comes to the management of the condition, you should aim to remove the offending agent and that is actually the first step if an offending agent is actually present. Drug-induced lichen planus as well as hepatitis C-induced lichen planus are common conditions that may present with lichenoid skin eruptions. And remember that lichen planus can be treated with topical medium potency to high potency corticosteroids that are applied on the affected area about one to three times a day. And when this eruption is actually controlled, the frequency of the drug use can be reduced or actually eliminated. And if the corticosteroids are used for prolonged periods, take care that you must avoid drug-induced secondary changes such as atrophy that are complications of the use of the corticosteroids. Here is a diagram to show you the classification of the topical steroids by potency. You have the very potent corticosteroids like clobetazole. You have the potent corticosteroids such as betamethasone, dilute, 
a, a potent corticosteroid such as betamethasone in that concentration. And then, of course, moderately potent in that concentration and mild such as hydrocortisone in that concentration. Take your time to actually look at these concentrations. And the next time you actually see a topical cream, have a look at what concentration is present in this topical cream. Occasionally, you may actually give oral corticosteroids. You may give oral prednisolone about 30 milligrams daily for two to four weeks. And then, of course, the oral lesions also require high potency steroids uh, given as an ointment, a gel or a mouthwash. Resistant cases may actually respond to PUVA. Remember that PUVA is just simply sorolin and ultraviolet A. And you may ask, actually give this patient oral retinoids, 0.5 milligrams per kg per day as a thropine, one to two milligrams per kg daily. And of course, topical 0.1 tacrolimus ointment can be used and has been useful for treatment of painful oral disease that is unresponsive to steroids. Prognosis of the condition, remember that this condition often clears by 18 months, but it can recur at certain intervals. And of course, there are some hypertrophic and atrophic variants and mucosal disease that are more persistent and last for years. Ulcerative mucosal disease is actually premalignant and may progress to cancer. Some complications include no involvement in about 10% of the patients where you have this longitudinal grooving or pitting, which we call wing formation, that is often reversible, of course. And then there is going to be some dystrophic or atrophic lesions that can produce scarring or permanent nail loss. There may be some scalp lesions that may cause scarring alopecia, which is loss of hair, which is very, very common. And then, of course, there may be some malignant change, but of course, this is very infrequent. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this lecture video on lichen planus. If you learned a lot, please drop a like drop a comment, share the video, and also subscribe to the channel. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kasev.